soldiers. It's really more effectively actually Highland soldiers. And it is Highland soldiers that I actually want to concentrate on today um, because I think there's something fairly specifically important about Highlanders. And of course, then the Highland regiments in the Seven Years' War are fairly easy to identify, whereas a lot of just Scots were serving in various different places. So I should start off saying a little bit more about who I am and apologising if I'm here under slightly false pretenses because I don't really think of myself as, as a military historian. Um, I don't know why that is really because most, a lot of what I've published has been on military history. Um, but my interest is really on the, the, um, the early American frontier uh, in the middle of the 18th century. And I've written a couple of books, one on, on the, the Seven Years' War in Virginia and Pennsylvania and another on the 1759 campaign for Quebec. Uh, and so, and I've worked a little bit on the revolution as well, but I'm not a military historian, even though I've published all those things. So, yeah. but my interest is, is much more on the interaction between Indians and whites and between set Indians and, and the British. And so those sort of aspects of frontier warfare. So um, that's really where I'm coming from. So I'm hoping you'll be slightly kind to me with some questions at the end. Uh, if, I, if I make a, a few slips somewhere. But what I really want to talk to tonight about is, is the role of Highland soldiers uh, in uh, North America during the Seven Years' War. And I think part of the reason I want to talk about this is we often have this rather sort of glamorous picture of Scottish and in particular Highland soldiers and their role in the expansion of the British Empire and in the defence of Britain. And the exploits of, of, of Scottish regiments came in the 19th century to be widely celebrated, uh, not only in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom and, and overseas. And actually, I've got some pictures later on of Canadian reenactors in Highland gear. Uh, and by the 19th century, um, it was certainly true that the role of Highland soldiers had become uh, widely glamorized and publicized. And th this is a painting from George IV's visit in 1822 to Edinburgh. Uh, which was the first visit of a reigning uh, monarch to Scotland since 1650. And the delight with which George IV adopted a uh, Highland garb uh, and the Highland uniform reflected in many ways the enthusiasm which Britons had developed by the 1820s for Scottish military exploits. And the pride of Scots in the Highland regiments and the important role which the regiments played in the British Army had emerged quite clearly by the early 19th century. But this evening I want to look at the origins of these, these ideas. And George IV's visit to Edinburgh was actually, is actually a good example because it was very highly choreographed. Um, the novelist, uh, Sir Walter Scott, was responsible for many of the arrangements. And in cooperation uh, with Major General David Stewart of Garth, uh, was responsible for dressing the king up in, the, in this Highland uniform. And Garth's picture, of course, is here. Uh, in, in the collection here. And it was actually Stuart of Garth who was responsible uh, for creating the first images, really, of Highland regiments, publishing the first influential history of the Highland regiments, sketches of the character, manner, and present state of the Highlands of Scotland. And it was this work, I think, that helped craft the imagery of the brave, disciplined, and ferocious Highland warrior that combined with Scott's romantic imagery to create the 19th century enthusiasm for Highland regiments. Yet, in some ways, the sudden development of this romantic enthusiasm for the Highland regiments is more than a little surprising. In the middle of the 18th century, in the wake of the Jacobite uprising, views of the military prowess of, of Scottish Highlanders outside the Highlands, both popular and educated military and civilian, English and Lowland Scots, denigrated the abilities of Highland warriors. The Highland clans were viewed as an undisciplined rabble, and most importantly, of course, disloyal. In the wake of the Battle of Culloden, the wearing of tartan had been outlawed, and the Dress Act of 1746 outlawed all items of Highland dress, including kilts, although an exception was made for Highland regiments, with the specific intent of suppressing Highland culture. The penalties were severe, uh, six months imprisonment for the first offence, seven years transportation for the second, simply for wearing Highland dress. What transformed these, possession, these perceptions, I think, was the military service of Highlanders in the late 18th century. And it was the involvement of the Highland regiments in the Seven Years' War in the American Revolution 
Napoleonic Wars that was responsible for this. Tonight, I'm going to focus on the involvement of the Highland Regiments during the Seven Years' War, and as well as outlining the service of Highland units in North America, uh, there were really four things that I want to focus on. The first was how did Highland units come to be recruited in the first place, considering this was the image of Highland troops, I think, held quite widely in Britain on the eve of the Seven Years' War. And secondly, I want to consider, did Highland soldiers actually brave, uh, behave with any particular courage or bravery during the war? That's the image, but does the image actually match up to reality? Thirdly, I want to think, were there any differences with other soldiers in the British Army, and why was that the case? And finally, I want to consider something that, that's quite dear to my own heart, but perhaps quite briefly at the end. Did Highland soldiers have a particular empathy with Native Americans? Because again, that's an image that's often presented, that Highlanders had this particular sympathy with Native Americans. And actually, it's true. If you look at, at traders, um, fur traders in America in the late 18th century, the overwhelming majority of them are Scottish. So was there some particular empathy there? So it makes sense to, consider, to start with some consideration of how these Highland units came to be recruited. After the Act of Union, it made sense to include Scottish units within the British Army. And one such unit was the Black Watch, which had its origins in independent companies raised to keep a watch on the Highlands to prevent cattle rustling and similar disorder. However, apart from the Black Watch, the government remained opposed to any increase in the number of Highland units serving in the British Army. However, the Seven Years' War placed immense strains on the British Army. The Seven Years' War was really the first global war, uh, and in its early years it was fought in North America, in Africa, in the West Indies, in, in Asia, in India, as well as in Europe. And in the first years it went very badly for the British. In 1755, the British Army sent to America under the command of Major General Edward Braddock, was destroyed by the French at the Battle of the Nongahela. In Europe, the French assembled an alliance with the Russians and Austrians, and soon overran the British-held island of Minorca, and the British government even considered the possibility of seeking an alliance with Spain, promising that Spain would receive Gibraltar in return for assistance. In 1756, French military victories continued in Europe and North America, while Native Americans descended on the American frontier and for three years devastated an area several times the size of Scotland. And I think, again, if you're in Britain, it's difficult to get a perception of just the huge areas in North America that were destroyed by this war. And a lot of this war takes place in North America. In 1757, matters grew even worse when the French captured Fort William Henry on the New York frontier. That's the famous highlight of the novel and the film, The Last of the Mohicans spreading panic that the French were about to descend on New York City itself. In Europe, the British Army under the command of the Duke of Cumberland was defeated by the French at the Battle of Hastenbeck, and the French forced Cumberland to sign the humiliating convention of Cluster 7, removing his army from the field while the French occupied most of the Netherlands. And I think this is important background because things are going so badly for the British, they have to find some way of, of of opposing the French. And in particular, in Britain, fears of French invasion of the British Isles themselves grew intensely, and the government was forced to reinforce the defences of Great Britain. There were several highly unpopular drafts for the Royal Navy in 1756, and then in 1757, the government passed the Militia Act. This act revived the English, not Scottish, militia, which had fallen into neglect. However, the militia was not a part-time amateur army, but rather this militia was to be a professional army drawn from the ranks of English citizenry. Men were chosen by ballot from the adult male population in each county for three years' service. Those chosen could pay for a replacement, which most chose to do, but the poor could not afford the cost. For those middling landowners or artisans who were selected, the payment of a replacement essentially became another really onerous and burdensome tax. As a result, when magistrates tried to enforce the act, there were sizable riots. And in addition to finance the war, the government was forced to raise taxes, particularly, and perhaps most unpopularly, the excise taxes on beer and cider, 
which resulted in riots in the west of England, particularly the cider riots in, in Devon and Cornwall. So by 1757, there was substantial hostility to the war across Britain. The landed and mercantile elites resented high taxes, the labouring poor resented the demands for militia service. Prime Minister William Pitt needed to find men to fill the ranks of his army without creating the sort of widespread unrest we see here. And he sought to tap new sources of manpower. In North America, the administration formed a new regiment known as the Royal American Regiment, or the 62nd, later the 60th Regiment. And the Royal American Regiment was specifically designed to allow foreign-born recruits, that is, in this case, American colonists, to enlist in the British Army and serve under foreign-born officers, men such as Lieutenant Colonel Henry Bouquet, who I'll say a little bit more about later. Recruiting American colonists could form part of a North American army, but could hardly meet all the needs of the, of the British in defending the British Isles. And it was against this background that the ministry turned to Highland troops. As early as 1751, James Wolfe, later the hero of the Plains of Abraham, at the time stationed in Banff, had written to a friend, musing that Highland troops might be useful to use against the French in North America. For, he argued, they were hardy, intrepid, accustomed to a rough country, but most importantly, no great mischief if they fall. In other words, not only were Highlanders good fighters, but they were expendable. Plans for the creation of Highland units had been circulating for some time, but it was the particular political and military crisis that I've been talking about in late 1756 and early 1757, which pushed the administration of William Pitt to act. Pitt drew up pl upon plans that had been presented the previous year to the Duke of Cumberland, suggesting that two battalions of a thousand men each might be raised in the Highlands, and later a second battalion of the Black Watch would be added to that. Uh, who could serve in North America if offers of land grants in America at the close of the war were made. The fact that they were to serve in North America, I think, is quite important because it ensured that there would be less damage done in case these units did not prove loyal. And this was the big fear about the potential of some sort of uh, rebellion. A rebellion in Britain might be dif difficult to contain during wartime. A rebellion in North America might have comparatively little impact. And in fact, British troops, not just Highland troops, did mutiny in North America in 1763 in what is known as the Stoppages Mutiny, but it had very little impact uh, on the world or, or the war at all. And in fact, it's very little known about, but it was a widespread mutiny across all the North American garrisons. The troops could also be encouraged to enlist by vague promises of land in North America at the end of their enlistments, and the idea that at the end of the war you could leave hardy Highlanders protecting the frontier of America was itself quite attractive to the ministry. In early 1757, Viscount Barrington, the Secretary of War, contacted the Duke of Argyll for advice on raising two new Highland regiments. Argyll suggested two commanders for the new regiments, Archibald Montgomery, brother of the 10th Earl of Eglinton, and Simon Fraser, son of the executed Lord Lovett. Lovett had been a Jacobite, uh, executed in uh, late 1740s, and his son becomes the commander of one of these regiments. The, governor, uh, the government approved, and Montgomery and Fraser quickly set about recruiting two new regiments, which would be known as Montgomery's Highlanders and Fraser's Highlanders. And this is an image, uh, actually just in the collection, with a nice little, uh, I was just listening to the, to the, uh, the, the um, movie about this, um, of the, the Black Watch mustering in 1756, the first regiment being prepared for service in North America. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about it, a very interesting little display just where you come in. So why did men enlist? In many ways it seems perverse that men who in the wake of Culloden had seen their way of life uh, brutally suppressed by the British Army should less than a decade later rush to join that same army? And I think that's, that's a question that a lot of people have. Why do people enlist in these armies when the British have just spent so long, or the government in London has spent so long trying to crush the Highlands, or at least that's the perception? First, I'd stress that the attachment to the Jacobite cause was not necessarily as strong as the image, the romantic image 
created by Sir Walter Scott in the 19th century, might have portrayed it. Uh, many men fought to support, support their clan chiefs, and many clan chiefs fought because of traditional loyalties or traditional enmities. And in the wake of Culloden, many Highlanders felt more than a little alienated from Charles Stuart, a bonny prince Charlie, who appeared as a rather <coughs> beat French or Italian fop whose concern was the crown of Great Britain, read England, not the Kingdom of Scotland. So I think one of the things we need to think, think about is that, that for ordinary Highlanders, their attachment to the Jacobite cause, for a lot of them, may not be perhaps as strong as the image we might get from reading Sir Walter Scott. Stuart of Garth argued that Highlanders joined the new regiments because of loyalty to their clan chiefs. For instance, he claimed that Simon Fraser without his state, money, or influence, found himself at the head of 800 men recruited by himself. Now, that claim is simply not true. Um, Fraser eventually managed to recruit 125 men. However, the influence of people like Fraser, I think, was vitally important. It wasn't necessarily the influence of clan chiefs, but often, often the influence of lesser officers that the chiefs recruited who in turn would recruit their kinsmen and neighbours. And I'm going to return to this later because I think this is actually a very important feature of these Scottish regiments that makes them different from regiments, from other regiments in the British Army. Secondly, there was a tradition of military service in the Highlands, and there was a myth propagated by those who wanted to, to recruit regiments in the Highlands that Highlands were populated by a brave and warlike race who were just too ready to take up arms for any cause. Now, while the Highlanders were not necessarily natural warriors, there had been traditions of service overseas. Uh, Scots had served in the Polish and Dutch armies, in particular during the 17th century, and the Dutch army even had an entirely Scotch brigade, the Prince of Orange's Scot uh, Scottish brigade. Since the Jacobite uprisings, Highlanders have been largely excluded from service in the British army. But now that ban was lifted, there was a stream of men ready and willing to serve. For these men, there was the lure of serving in Highland dress, of reasserting their identity as Highlanders, serving with Highland arms, notably the broadsword, and being able to equip themselves honorably overseas and restoring pride to their family and clans. And this might seem somewhat superficial, the whole importance of restoring pride, but many contemporaries commented on the importance of being able to wear traditional Highland dress, prescribed since the 45, and the vital importance of clan pride. And I think this did matter to many of the, of the recruits, and many of the people recruiting them. However, I think in the end, there were two main and, and closely related reasons why people joined the Highland regiments, money and land. And many recruits believed that the enlistment badges and subsequent pay would provide some security for their families left behind while they served out their investment in America. Recruiters also made promises, often but not always unfounded, that the men would get substantial land grants in North America at the end of the war. And this was an incredibly powerful lure to men who lived in areas where there was a shortage of land and only marginal cultivation. And indeed, in both 1755 and 1756, there were harvest and crop failures in Scotland. And while there was not famine in the Highlands, there certainly was dearth, malnutrition, and hunger. And here's one of these images of these Canadians uh, dressed up as, uh, as Highlanders. Three Highland regiments were quickly organized and dispatched to North America. The first to arrive was the 42nd Regiment, the Black Watch, which began arriving in New York as early as June 1756. By 1757, there were 3,867 Highland soldiers and 207 Highland officers in North America, representing about 27.5% of the rank and file and 31.5% of the officers in the British Army in North America. So the Highland uh, regiments, Highland troops, make up between 27 and 31% of the total British Army in North America. This is quite a considerable uh, contingent. And in addition to these numbers, many other Highlanders served in non-Highland units, for instance, in the 58th Regiment and Struthers, 9% uh, of the men serving were Highlanders, 
although the regiment, despite its name, had no Scottish connection. So we know that 30% you know, of troops in, Scot in, in North America were Highlanders, were for in Highland regiments, but another 10% may have been serving in other regiments in the British Army. So possibly 35 to 40% of the British Army in North America were Highland forces. I want to talk now as briefly as I can, which I think is not going to be as briefly as I'd like, about the actual service of these regiments uh, during the war. It was not until 1758 that Highland units saw substantial combat in North America. In the summer of 1758, the 78th Regiment was dispatched to join General Geoffrey Amherst in his assault on the French fortress of Louisbourg. Louisbourg was in many ways the gateway to the St. Lawrence River, which had to be taken to take Canada, and was the most advanced citadel in North America, with Vauban-style stone walls two miles in circumference, while the port was defended by a series of batteries. The defences were manned by 3,000 men, supported by 2,600 sailors and marines. Any attack would need to be made by landing troops on the rocky beaches outside the town, and then by uh, besieging the fortress. Amherst appointed Wolfe to command the landings, which were the most dangerous part of the entire operation. Despite the high Atlantic surf, which made Wolfe fear that it would be a rash and ill-attempted attempt to land, some of his men managed to get ashore and found a weak point in the French defences. Wolfe followed up quickly, landing Fraser's Highlanders, the 78th, um, who quickly drove back the French into the walls of, of uh, Louisbourg. And now it simply became a matter of besieging the post in regular European style. And with the Royal Navy preventing uh, all attempts to relieve the port, the garrison surrendered after a siege of less than three weeks. While the Frasers were besieging Louisbourg, the Black Watch were sent to join General Abercrombie in his attack on Fort Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga was a substantial French fortification dominating the portage from Lake George to Lake Chaplin and the overland route to Canada. The expedition against it was composed of nearly 16,000 British troops and which was the largest British expedition ever yet mounted in North America. On June the 28th, 1758, as British troops began to land near the French force, advanced British forces skirmished with the French and the skirmish proved costly for the British for the second in command of the British force, Lord Howe, was shot dead by a French sniper. Howe's loss greatly demoralised the British army and the, the army halted. The delay allowed the French commander, General Montcalm, to prepare for, his, for the assault, and Montcalm ordered his men to build an abattis of felled trees and to construct, construct a log breastwork topped with sandbags in front of the fort, and this would prove very important. It was not until July the 8th that Abercrombie finally decided to attack with the British Army. While he could have outflanked the French, he chose instead to launch a frontal assault with his infantry against the French lines into these abattis and, and the log breastworks that Montcalm had built. When the attack began, with the Black Watch in the centre, the infantry rushed forward into the French trenches. Again, here's another image from, from the collection here of the Black Watch, and you can see them trying to scramble through these branches towards the fortress. Most men never made it. One private who witnessed the battle wrote, it was surprising to me to think, uh, to think more of the regiments should be drawn up the breastwork for such slaughter. Another survivor recollected, their lines were full and they killed our men so fast that we could not gain it. We got behind trees, logs, and stumps, and covered ourselves as we could from the enemy's fire. The ground was strewed with the dead and dying. It happened that I got behind a white oak stump, which was so small that I had to lay on my side and stretch myself out, and I could hear the men screaming and see them dying all around me. Once in a while, the enemy would cease firing for a minute or two to have the smoke clear away, so they might take better aim. In one of these intervals, I sprang from my perilous situation and gained a stand which I thought would be more secure, behind a large pine log where several of my comrades had already taken shelter. But the balls came here as thick as ever. One of the men raised his head a little above the log, and the ball struck him in the centre of the forehead. We lay there till sunset, and not receiving orders from any officer, 
the men crept off, leaving all the dead and most of the wounded. Abercrombie's command post was some way from the battle, in case a French sniper should target him, and he knew of the battle only from dispatches sent back by his officers. Consequently, he simply kept ordering his men forward into the slaughter. By nightfall, he finally realised that his army had been decimated, and Blackwatch, I think, loses about half of the men, and now panicked that the French would counterattack. The whole army was thrown into confusion, and Abercrombie ordered a swift retreat. By dawn the next day, his whole army was rowing for its life down Lake George, fleeing an enemy one quarter of its size. Historian Fred Anderson has called the defeat of Ticonderoga Britain's greatest humiliation of the war. And I'm going to return to, to some of this bravery, particularly from the Black Watch, later on. While the Black Watch and Frasers were deployed in the north, Montgomery's 77th, were employed in the West in the campaign to take Fort Duquesne. The expedition was commanded by, Major Gen by General John Forbes, another Scot from Pitt and Creek, just outside of Berlin. Fort Duquesne was a vital French post that controlled access to the West, and it was through Fort Duquesne that supplies for the Indian raiders who paralyzed the American frontier came. Forbes had a daunting task to advance his army across the Appalachian Mountains westwards. To do this, he had to construct roads over which his army would move, and magazines to supply his army. His second in command, Colonel Henry Bouquet, wrote, Those who have only experienced the severities and dangers of a campaign in Europe can scarcely form an idea of what is to be done and endured in an American war. In an American campaign, everything is terrible. The face of the country, the climate, the enemy. There is no refreshment for the healthy, nor relief for the sick. A vast, unhospitable desert, unsafe and treacherous, surrounds them, where victories are not decisive, but defeats are ruinous, and simple death is the least misfortune that can happen to them. Forbes used Montgomery's regiments uh, as scouters and flankers, and believed that as Highlanders, they possessed a, suit of, a, a particular suitability for that task, ranging through the woods and forests. By September, the force was nearing their objective, but Colonel Bouquet, without consulting Forbes, decided to send out an advanced party under the command of Major, General, of Major James Grant to reconnoitre Fort Duquesne and to try and destroy supplies, outbuildings, and an Indian camp outside the fort. Grant took with him 750 men, including all of Montgomery's regiment and, so, and some of Pennsylvania and Virginia provincials. However, when his force arrived outside Fort Duquesne in the middle of the night, they became confused and in darkness fired at one another. Then the French launched a counter surprise attack. Grant later informed Forbes, in less than half an hour, all was in confusion. Fear had then got the better of every other passion and I hope I shall never again see such a panic amongst the troops. The French fort routed Grant's force, and British losses were heavy. The French and Indians killed and captured over 20 officers, including Grant himself, and 271 men, over a third of the force. Later stories reported that the French and Indians pinned their kilts to the branches of trees and the walls of the fort, as a reminder to their comrades of what might befall them. Although there's a lot of the, quite a historical debate about whether this pinning of the kilts of Montgomery's men is a real story or not, it's probably a 19th century um, invention. But I think it, it reveals a lot of the fear that these men had of the French. After Grant's defeat, the French pressed their advantage and attacked the forward British base at Loyal Hannah, throwing the army into disarray. The French commander, the Marchand de Ligneri, believed that he had won two major victories and the British would now not continue their campaign this season. So he sent home his militia and Indian allies, leaving Fort Duquesne almost undefended. By good fortune, Forbes heard of this and decided to push his force forward, which included the remnants of the 77. Hearing that Forbes was coming, the French had virtually no troops left. They set fire to the fort and abandoned it. So by the end of 1758, uh, Scottish troops, Highland forces, had been involved in this major campaign in the West, one major defeat at Grant's uh, defeat, 
and won major victory capturing Fort Duquesne. The campaign of 1759 was in many ways even more ambitious than that of 1758, involving a three-pronged attack on Canada. The Black Watch and Montgomery's were to march with Geoffrey Amherst up the Hudson and Lake Champlain Valley to attempt once more to take Fort Ticonderoga and then push on towards Montreal. The campaign was almost the opposite of the year before, as Amherst met no French resistance. When the force arrived at Ticonderoga, the French simply withdrew and blew up the fort. Amherst advanced timorously to the northern end of Lake Champlain, captured another French fort, Fort St. Frederick, which the French also abandoned. But now, rather than pressing on towards Montreal to assist Wolfe, who by this time was in Quebec, he delayed rebuilding the French fortifications and remained there for the rest of the year. Meanwhile, Fraser's Highlanders were dispatched to join James Wolfe in his attempt to take Quebec, at the capital and the heart of French Canada. Wolfe's force arrived in St. Lawrence on June the 9th, 1759, but made slow progress. By the end of July, it had become clear to Wolfe that the French were strongly entrenched all around the city of Quebec, and any attempt to seize the city would be difficult. On July the 31st, he ordered his men to attempt a difficult assault on the French lines near Montmorency Falls, six miles west of the city. Wolfe's plan called for one detachment, which included Fraser's Highlanders, to land at low tide and assault the French positions, while another detachment would cross a ford below the Montmorency Falls. Unfortunately, the plan went completely wrong. Uh, the boats landing on the shore ran aground, providing perfect targets for the French artillery and snipers. And when the men were finally landed, the grenadiers, who had been the principal targets of the French, rushed forward uh, to the French lines and were mown down. The whole British force was soon thrown into disarray, and Wolfe ordered a retreat. Only a party of Fraser's Highlanders remained very famously behind on the beach, refusing to retreat until they had brought off all their wounded to protect them from parties of Indians who came down onto the beach to scalp the dead and dying. After the battle, Wolfe berated his men for their dis disorder and impetuosity and added, Amherst and the Highland regiments alone, with the soldier-like and cool manner they were formed in, would undoubtedly have beat back the whole Canadian army had they been allowed. So despite this defeat, Wolfe is actually very impressed by the behaviour of, uh, of Fraser's, and this is really where his impression of the, uh, of the Highland troops completely changes. Wolfe spent the next six weeks attempting to find a way to attack the French positions. Eventually, he decided on a dangerous assault uh, just west of the city, at a cove protected only by a small number of French militia. The once fortune favoured Wolfe, as Wolfe's army approached the shore, according to popular legend, French-speaking Captain Donald MacDonald of Fraser's Highlanders, who had served in the French army after Culloden, was challenged by French guards. He replied in clear French that the boats were a supply convoy from Montreal, and if the guards did not keep quiet, then the British would hear them. MacDonald's replies were believed, and Wolfe's army was able to land undiscovered. Wolf's men scramble up the, crypt, up, up the cliffs to the heights above and formed ready for battle. Fraser's Highlanders point posted towards the left. Then the French commander Montcalm made a fatal mistake and ordered his men out of, the relatively safe, out of the relative safety of the city of Quebec to attack Wolf's army before they could entrench their positions. The battle that followed on the Plains of Abraham was brief. The French forces, which included large numbers of militia, were thrown into confusion and were quickly routed by Wolfe's regulars. During the battle itself, Fraser's Highlanders suffered few casualties, but in the, in the aftermath, they engaged in a vicious pursuit of the French with their broadswords. A sergeant in the Grenadiers recalled that if the French, quote, tried to outrun a Highland one, trying to get the, the spelling in, in this rather um, nice account, they stood a bad chance, for whash went the broadsword. In this pursuit, Fraser suffered considerable losses, and indeed one officer commented, we had more killed and wounded in the skirmishing than in the general action. Despite the death of Wolfe, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham was a decisive victory, and the French soon surrendered the, the city of Quebec. 
Fighting in Canada, however, continued into 1760. In April 1760, uh, the French won a victory at the Battle of St. Foy, just outside Quebec, which could have resulted in the loss of Quebec had not British supply ships almost immediately arrived from Britain. After the battle, Fraser's Highlanders would remain in Quebec, and indeed many of the men would settle in Canada, a policy encouraged by the British government after the war. While Fraser's Highlanders were garrisoning garrison in Quebec, the Black Watch were dispatched to assist General Geoffrey Amherst in his attack on Montreal. Rather than attack Montreal directly from the south, Amherst chose to descend on the city down to St. Lawrence, cutting off all the links of the city with the interior. While British troop, when British troops arrived at Montreal in September, after a relatively uneventful march and descent of the St. Lawrence, French forces had little option but to surrender not only Montreal, but all of Canada. While Fraser's and the Black Watch battled the French, Montgomery's Highlanders were sent in 1760, and then again in 1761, in two expeditions to punish the Cherokee for their war against the South Carolinians. The Cherokee War has complex causes, and I'm going to say a little bit more about, about it in a couple of minutes, as the Cherokees had been British allies and had fought with the British at Fort Duquesne. But now the Highlanders were ordered to advance through Cherokee country, burning villages and destroying crops to bring the Cherokee to their knees. The two expeditions did devastate Cherokee country and forced the tribe to surrender substantial proportions of their lands to South Carolina. The war against the Cherokees may have been unpalatable, but it saved Montgomery's from an even worse fate that befell the Black Watch and Fraser's, being dispatched to the West Indies. For two years, the Black Watch and Fraser's <laughs> saw action in Guadeloupe, Martinique, and Cuba, particularly outside Havana in operations against the Spanish, who had finally entered the war in support of France. Following a lengthy siege, Havana and Cuba surrendered to the British on August the 14th, 1762. The Highland regiments were quickly withdrawn from the Caribbean when they had suffered crippling losses from disease and were stationed back in North America. When the Treaty of Paris was signed in February 1763, the war seemed at an end. However, France's former native allies remained restless. And in May 1763, they overran British garrisons across the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley in a conflict known as Pontiac's War. The Black Watch and Montgomery's were quickly sent to relieve the besieged garrison, garrison at Fort Pitt. On August 5, 1763, at Bushy Run, the relief party was attacked by a large force of Indians. The British had never defeated the Indians in woodland warfare before, and the disastrous defeat of Braddock's army just eight years before and only a few miles away must have been in the minds of the men. However, the men held their ground in a fierce battle that continued until nightfall. The next morning, the Indian attack recommenced. Colonel Henry Bouquet, who commanded the force, realized that he would need to find a new strategy to break the Indians. He ordered some companies from the Black Watch and Montgomery's to fall back and to feign a retreat. Upon seeing this, the Indians, believing that once more they had broken the British army, rushed forward, at which point the remaining companies of the regiments appeared from dense cover to break the flanks of the attackers. And this is actually part of the back of the, the corner up here, is actually the, the background image. You can't see it very well most of the time that I've been using for this whole battle. And I think actually this is one of the most important battles certainly for the Black Watch in North America, where they really show how far they've come. And I was a little surprised, disappointed, looking through the museum that it wasn't mentioned. Although it is on one of the little powder horns, I think. So, um, uh, but Bushy Run, I think, very important. The Indian line collapsed and they fled. This was a very important victory for the British. But while their losses were high, the force was able to push on to Fort Pitt and relieve the siege. It was also very important psychologically, as it was the first time a British force had defeated the Indians in open battle. Bouquet was clear where the victory lay. He wrote, the Highlanders are the bravest men I ever saw, and their behaviour in that obstinate affair does them the highest honour. By the end of the war, Bouquet was not alone in admiring the bravery of Highlanders in combat. Highlanders had arrived in North America with a reputation for ferocity. French prisoners who surrendered to the British during the siege of Louisbourg said 
that they stood in the utmost awe of the savages, and feared lest our Highlanders should not give them quarter. The French at Quebec called the Highlanders the Sauvage des Cosse, Scottish Indians or Scottish savages. The views of British commanders were perhaps a little more restrained. Uh, Commander-in-Chief Geoffrey Amherst praised the Highlanders as the most excellent troops, intrepid, subordinate, sober, and inde indefatigable. Wolfe wrote that his Highlanders always behaved with distinction. Indeed, praise for the behaviour of Highland troops seems to have been all but universal. The only one occasion on which Highland troops garnered any criticism was at Grant's defeat outside Fort Duquesne, and on that occasion it was clear that it was the commander, rather than the men themselves, who had principal responsibility for the defeat. It was not only military officers who praised the Highlanders. When the Black Watch departed from Philadelphia in 1767, the Pennsylvania Gazette published an essay praising the regiment, which, to quote, since its arrival in America is distinguishable for having undergone the most amazing fatigues, made long and frequent marches through an inhospitable country, bearing the most excessive heat and severest cold, with alacrity and cheerfulness, frequently encamping in the deep snows, such as those who inhabit the interior parts of this province but rarely see, and which those who only who inhabit the most northern parts of Europe can have an idea of. Continually ex exposed in camp and on their marches to the alarms of a savage enemy who has frequently flew from them successlessness in their attempts. Uh, successlessness, I love as a, as a word. Uh, were, present, were present at almost every engagement during the late war in the West Indies and America. They have the sincere thanks of the freemen of this province. No other regiment I have, that I've come across garnered such praise uh, in the Seven Years' War. So this is the, the residents of Pennsylvania thanking the Black Watch on their departure from America for their service. The evidence does seem to suggest that there was something different about the Highland regiments. Stuart of Garth claimed that the Highland troops behaved so well because they had a very high moral code. So misconduct was virtually unknown. He argued that among the Black Watch in particular, there were few courts martial, and for many years no instance occurred of corporal punishment. Now, while these claims are so often are rather overstated, Highland troops actually do, do appear much less frequently in court martial records than members of other battalions besides whom they were serving. So there does seem to be something here, although Highland troops do seem to have liked their drink. So most of, most of the disorder seems to relate to, to alcohol, but compared to other units, if you look at court martial records, they do seem to have behave, been behaving in a more orderly fashion. It is certainly easy to get an impression that Highland troops generally behaved with great bravery. Even at the di disastrous defeat at Ticonderoga, the Black Watch had hurled themselves at the French lines until their casualties were too high to continue. Indeed, the casualty rate for the British Army as a whole during the Seven Years' War was 9%. For the Highland regiments, it was 32%. Historian Colin Calloway has commented that they might as well have been at Culloden. By 1762, the two battalions of the Black Watch numbered only 480 men, and James Adair argued that the entire regiment did not contain above 30 men fit for actual service. Combat casualties accounted for many of these losses. At Ticonderoga, of the 10 companies of the Black Watch present in the action, more than 500 of all ranks were subsequently listed as killed, wounded, or missing. At Fort Duquesne in September 1758, Montgomery's Highlanders lost 223 men. At the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, outside the walls of Quebec, on September 13, 1759, Fraser's Highlanders lost nearly 150 men killed or wounded. At St. Foy in April, another 213 were killed. But the bigger killer was often disease. Both battalions of the 42nd Black Watch and nine companies of the 77th Montgomery's were sent to the Caribbean. When they mustered in New York before departure, they numbered 2,075 men. In November 1762, only 795 remained. Few of these men had died in combat, the majority have died from tropical diseases, in particular yellow fever, malaria, 
and similar tropical, tropical diseases. So great were these losses that they caused some hardship in Scotland. In 1763, the nobility and gentry and freeholders in the northern and highland counties of Scotland sent a petition to the Secretary of War. The regions, they claim, had been so badly drained of men by the war that they were put to great distress for want of hands to labour the ground. They requested that the few remains of these gallant men may be sent home to repeople the country and breed a race of soldiers who may emulate the actions of their fathers in another war. These casualty figures suggest that Highland troops did fight with unusual bravery, or perhaps that they were exposed to more frequent combat than other units, although there's not an awful lot of, of uh, evidence that they were exposed to more combat. At Ticonder and, and at Bushy Run, at the landings at Louisbourg, at Montmorency Falls, in the pursuit after the Battle of, of the Plains of Abraham, Highland units seem to have excelled. Some contemporaries believe that the savagery of Highland clans made Highlanders perfect warriors. Others have argued that the Highland environment created a hardy race of men well suited in the forests of North America. Perhaps there is a small, a very small component of truth here, but in reality there are probably other more mundane explanations why Highland regiments fought so bravely. First, I'd like to point to the way that Highland regiments were commanded. Unlike other regiments, Fraser's and Montgomery's were led by lieutenant colonels rather than colonels. This meant that they did not get the seniority of rank as colonels, particularly the pay, um, but it also meant that the regiments were able to have a second major appointed who assisted in the command of a battalion, which was often useful, particularly in training and disciplining troops, exactly the areas where the Scottish regiments seemed to have excelled. The impact of a second major would have been magnified by the fact that many of these regiments were also dramatically under strength, so their ratio of men to officers was even lower. In addition, although these were new recruits, most, most of the officers had prior military experience, either in the British Army, in the independent companies in Scotland that had been raised, or in the Dutch and French Scots brigades. The combination of officers provided a different range of service records, and this may also help to explain why Scottish units seem to have behaved so well. Their officers were used to a range of different conditions and tasks. So when they uh, met unusual conditions in America, they were more prepared to, uh, to adapt their performance. Another unit that seems to have behaved quite well was the Royal American Regiment, commanded by Henry Bouquet. And again, overseas experience may have some importance here. Secondly, I'd like to point to the ways in which regiments were recruited particularly Fraser's and Montgomery's. The officers in each regiment were to receive their commissions free, which again was different. Officers in other British regiments had to pay for their commissions, meaning that they did not have to pay for them, but in return, they were expected to raise a quota of troops. Majors and captains were expected to raise 100 men each, while a lieutenant was expected to raise 25. This meant that many capable candidates came forward who in turn were able to enlist men in their local communities. So the fact that officers didn't have to pay for commissions, the fact that they recruited people that they already knew, often relatives, I think creates a unique network of kinship amongst the men, as well as meaning that many of the companies were formed of men from the same village, the same glen, or the same island. These bonds were very important in encouraging the men to fight. And I think this is even stronger in the Seven Years' War than amongst groups such as the Powell's regiments during the First World War. This uniqueness continued once the regiments were in combat. Other regiments in the British Army would replace losses by drafting men from other units or by recruiting men where they were stationed. Units quickly became collections of men from around the world. Some of the units at Louisbourg in 1758 actually recruited French deserters particularly foreign troops who were serving in the French army. When men were drafted from other units, typically officers would send those men that they did not want in the regiment, troublemakers or misfits. Not surprisingly, they did not always help unit cohesion. Because of the unique nature of the Highland regiments, they did not replace combat units in this way. If new men were recruited, it was always in the Highlands, 
and the number of new recruits never fully replaced those who had been lost. Hence, Highland units were always under strain. <coughs> One reason why men could not be easily drafted from other regiments was because so many of the recruits were Gaelic speaking. And it quickly became a requirement that all officers also much, must speak Gaelic. This served to create a very distinct identity amongst the troops. The Highland regiments had this very clear, very strong, and very distinctive identity. And again, I think this is one of the most important reasons why they fought so well. Beginning in this period, commanders like General Wolfe began to realize that regimental pride and morale could be much more important in, and effective in getting men to fight than fear of the lash and fear of punishment which was how men had been encouraged to fight in the British Army in the early 18th century. And this was the period that the British Army began to realise the importance of regimental pride and tradition. And I would suggest that there's not many, uh, many regiments that have a stronger pride and tradition than the Black Watch. And of course that goes right back to this period. The unique uniform, the Highland kilt, the use of the broadsword, the wide use of Gaelic, all identified the Highland units as being distinctive from other regiments in the British Army and engendered great pride in these regiments. More than anything else, this encouraged the men to fight. Another reason that some have suggested for the success of the Highlanders during the Seven Years' War was the belief that the Highlanders shared similar traits with the Indians and therefore that they would make good Indian fighters. Highland clans, it was argued, shared features with Indian clans, and the nature of Highland warfare and the warring nature of the Highland clans were similar to the cultures of Native Americans. Many of these claims are clearly greatly exaggerated, and while British officers and British writers in general drew parallels between Highlanders and Indians, being able to draw parallels between two cultures is not the same as two very separate cultures having a particular understanding. The relationship between Highlanders and Indians was much more complex. Certainly there were plenty of Highlanders themselves who seemed to have believed that they had a special relationship with Indians. When Mungo Campbell applied for a commission, he argued, I have lived long enough in Loch Harbour to qualify me for fighting against Indians. General John Forbes hoped that the Cherokee who accompanied his army would be pleased upon seeing their cousins, the Highlanders. Forbes, of course, was Scottish, so he thought there were some links. Lord Loudon, another Scot, believed that Highlanders and Indians had a particular empathy. Captain James Murray of the Black Watch wrote that the Indians like the Highlanders, so the feelings were mutual. Indeed, the Iroquois helped wounded Black Watch warriors off the field after the, the assault on Fort Ticonderoga. They did not help other units. So there is some evidence that Highland troops thought of Indians in a slightly different way compared to other units and other men in the British Army. In particular, this was true of Grant and Montgomery, who both headed the expeditions in 1760 and 1761, which ravaged Cherokee country, burning Indian towns and villages, and destroying crops, ripping up orchards, leaving the survivors now almost naked and in want of every necessity. Such campaigns must have seemed reminiscent of the brutal suppression of the Jacobites in the Highlands. Both Grant and Montgomery refused to escalate the, the destruction of Indian towns to the extent that their commander-in-chief, Geoffrey Amherst, desired. And Grant wrote, I could not help pitying them a little. And indeed, when Grant and his men returned to Charleston, South Carolina, Instead of being celebrated as victors over the Indians, they were booed and hissed by the assembled crowd, but not completely annihilating the Cherokee. Similarly, during the Quebec campaign, uh, when there were atrocities committed against Indians and against French civilians, the main perpetrators do not seem to have been Highland regiments. And if anyone was to blame for the destruction of civilian property and the scalping of Indians, it was Gorham's Rangers, who were North American recruits, and the Highlanders gained reputation for restraint. The understandings which did exist between Highland troops and Native Americans were perhaps more the result of experiences in America than fundamental common bonds. Highland regiments were regularly stationed in frontier outposts, and as a result, Highland soldiers had regular contact with Indian people. 
particularly in later periods, in the late 1760s, when many of these myths seem to have developed. Officers and men developed a relationship with Indian women. Highland soldiers serving in Indian country often replaced shoes with moccasins, sometimes wore leggings under kilts, carried tomahawks in place of war swords, and used powder horns, I think there's examples again in the museum here, made by Indian women. Close encounters meant that Highland soldiers were not always blind to their common humanity with Indian people or to some shared experiences. So what can we finally conclude about the nature of Highland soldiers in North America during the Seven Years' War? I think there is no doubt that Highland soldiers in the shape of the Black Watch, uh, Brazers and Montgomery's Highlanders, played a very significant role in the conflict in North America. They fought extensively across the continent in all the major campaigns and battles and played a central role in the victory. But were they different from other units in the British Army? I think the answer actually does seem to be yes, although perhaps a slightly limited yes. I would argue that this is probably not because of any inherent differences in the nature of the men themselves, but because of the unique identity fostered through recruitment practices, the network of kinship, because of pride in the regiment, garment by language, weaponry, uniform, because of the nature of the command of the units, because of the second major, officers with a wide range of experience, all of these things mark the Highland units as different. All of this made the Highland regiments uh, different and would provide the basis over which in the following years they would create that legacy which Stuart of Garth would memorialise in the 1820s. So I do believe that Highland units were different, but not necessarily because there's something specific about Highlanders themselves. That's where I'll finish. I'm not too late. <laughs>